Acho que... Boa tarde a todas, todos e todas. Estamos aqui é, para a primeira sessão é, compartilhada né, do nosso seminário, do nosso quinto seminário do Reto. Uh, uh, be welcome, Tito and Silvia. It's a great pleasure to have you here with us. I'm going to introduce you quickly in Portuguese. And then we start with Silvia. Silvia Venturelli é, completou seu doutorado é, em Platão e traduziu, né? You have translated Hippias Minor. Então, traduziu é, para o italiano o diálogo é, Hippias Menor e vai nos falar sobre Epidex. Essa mesa é uma mesa sobre Epidex, né, de Platão, começando com Silvia, e chegando lá na Antiguidade Tardia com o Tito, depois. Então, a, passo a palavra a Silvia e agradeço mais uma vez pela presença. Thank you very much, Silvia, and I pass the word to you. Uh, just to, remem uh, to remind us that we have 20 minutes each, and then uh, another 20 minutes for uh, questions and answers. Okay. So, good morning, or rather good evening uh, from Italy. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank uh, all the members of the Retor Group for organizing uh, this uh, very interesting seminar and uh, also for giving me the opportunity to participate today. I apologize in advance for my English pronunciation, but uh, I hope you can uh, all uh, understand and uh, follow my presentation. And uh, I hope also that uh, it will be interesting. <laughs> okay. As you can see from the title, I will deal with a particular kind of uh, epideitic rhetoric, uh, and namely the sophistic epideixis. And uh, I will examine the testimony that uh, Plato's dialogues offer about it. In particular, I will concentrate on a specific case, that of the speech attributed to the sophist Hippias of Elis in the dialogue Hippias Minor. Mm. Well, I shall begin with a brief overview of the use and meaning of the noun epidexis and of the verb epideichnomy in Plato's dialogues. Uh, you have text one, two, three, and four in the handout. I hope you can all see my handout. Uh, well, we can see that these terms, so epideixis and epideichnomy, are used by Plato still with a rather broad range of meanings, beginning with the basic meaning of exhibition and display of ability with reference to any field of intellectual as well as practical ability. For example, in the first passage from the dialogue Lakes, this is the passage text one in the handout, the verb epideichnomy refers to the performance of a fighting armor that took place before the beginning of the dialogue, thus offering the starting point for the following discussion on the virtue of courage. I refer to text one, but we are not going to read the text. This is better. Um, however, in other passages, it is possible to see that epidexis and epideichnomy have already acquired a more specialized meaning, referring in a technical way to the declamations of the sophists. We can see this meaning in the three major platonic dialogues where sophists appear as main characters namely Protagoras, Gorgias, and Hippias Minor, the last one being the dialogue on which we, we will focus later. All the three passages that you can see reported in the handout, text 2, 3, and 4, uh, use the verb epideichnomy in the aorist tense with reference to a speech that has just been concluded and that is followed by the questions of the audience. Of course, among the listeners, there is also Socrates, who takes the opportunity to open the effective dialogue with his typical question and answer dialectical method. We can read these passages, at least a part of them, 
beginning with the text two from the Protagoras. I read the uh, translation and then the Greek text. text. Um, so text two, uh, after such and so great a display, Protagoras ceased speaking. Protagoras men, tosauta kai toyauta epideixamenos ape pausa totologu. Where tosauta refers to the length of the speech and toyauta to its qualities. But of course it is also uh, a bit uh, ironical. Uh, then text three from the Gorgias. Um, I read the third part. Gorgias gave us an admirable varied presentation just a short while ago. Pollagar kaikala gorgia semino ligon proteron epedaixato. And then text four from the Ipias Minor. Uh, here is uh, it's uh, Audicus Judicus who is speaking, inviting Socrates to comment on uh, Ipias lecture. And he says, Why then are you so silent, Socrates, when Hippias has given so imposing a display? Su de deti sigas, o Socrates, i piutus auta epidexamenu. And then uh, he continues, Why don't you join us in praising what he said, or refute it if you think that anything was not well said? And here it is worth noting uh, not only the use of the verb epideichnui, but also the invitation to praise, sunipainain, or blame, elenking uh, the speech of Ipias. Uh, well, then we should mention also another text, text uh, five, that is a passage from the Gorgias, where Callicles claims that uh, a feature of Gorgias' performances was responding to any question from the audience. On this basis, and uh, on the basis of another passage from the Hippias Minor, some scholars, such as Gautrie, have argued that uh, the sophistical epideixis could take the form of either continuous speech or questions from the audience. From the passages we have just read, the so text 2, 3 and 4, However, it seems clear that the questions were certainly part of the exhibition in a broader sense, but the term epidexis was used in a narrower sense to indicate the long speech or declamation, which was followed by a sort of question time. We can see, uh, of course, an example of this speech is in the myth narrated by Protagoras in the homonymous dialogue of Plato, as well as, of course, in the best known examples that are Gorgias, Helen, and Palamides, and Prodicus Heracles, preserved by Xenophon. Uh, well, I don't read the text uh, five, but I would like to talk about uh, text two, three, and four again, um, because uh, a closer reading of these passages reveals another feature uh, which is particularly relevant uh, for the Ipias Minor. It can be noted, uh, in fact, that uh, the three main Platonic dialogues uh, involving sophistical epideixis, Protagoras, Gorgias, and Ipias Minor, present uh, three different uh, dramatic situations concerning exactly the relation between epideixis and dialogue, which has also consequences, uh, as we shall see, on our ability to historically reconstruct these epideixis. In the first case, that of the Protagoras, text one, Protagoras gave a long speech containing, containing the famous myth of Prometheus, which is reported in the Platonic dialogue and occupies the entire first part of it. Certainly, this speech provides us with some information on the views and theories of the sophist, and probably on his use on, of mythological elements in his uh, epideixis. And it is also possible that this speech is based on an actual work by Protagoras. However, we cannot consider this speech to be the faithful reproduction of a speech actually given by Protagoras, but rather a fictitious speech pronounced by Protagoras as a character of Plato's dialogue. Diels and Kranz reasonably classify these passages as C, imitation, while Lux and Most classify it as D, doctrine. The Gorgias, on the other hand, 
presents an opposite uh, situation. For Socrates arrives when Gorgias has uh, already concluded his speech. And thus we can imagine that the first part of the dialogue refers to principles and doctrines defended by Gorgias and perhaps also to precise works by him, but we have no indication about the title and content of the speech alluded to at the beginning of the dialogue. And that because Socrates, as we have just said, could not listen to it and therefore cannot ask questions about it. Gorgias uh, Epideixis in Plato's dialogues, as far as we know, remains therefore a purely imaginary speech, and we cannot say whether Plato had a specific epideixis in his mind while composing the Gorgias or not. Still different and more complicated is the case of the Hippias Minor, which we have seen in text 4. The dialogue indeed begins when Hippias has already concluded his lecture like Gorgias in the Monuments dialogue. But there is an important difference, because in the Hippias Minor, Socrates was present and attended the performance. At the beginning of the dialogue, as we have seen, Socrates is urged by Eudicus, who is probably the organizer of the meeting, to intervene and ask Hippias some questions about his lecture. Therefore, the Hippias Minor presents a particularly interesting situation because during the dialogue, especially in the first part, there are several references to the content of uh, Hippias Epidexis, and thus uh, we have some clues for the reconstruction of the speech, which is likely to be a real one. And this, I think, precisely because the speech is not reported in the dialogue and is therefore excluded from the dramatic fiction. In text uh, uh, 6 uh, to 9, I have collected the evidence uh, that uh, the dialogue Hippias Minor provides, provides about Hippias' speech. The first passage, text 6, is the first question that Socrates asks uh, to Hippias, following uh, Eudicus' exhortation and claiming that there are many things uh, he would like to ask about the lecture Hippias gave about Homer. Uh, these are the first two lines of the text uh, in the handout. Caimen o eudike estige haideos anputsoimeni piu onunde elegen periomeru. Thus we have almost a title of Hippias lecture, which can be indicated as on Homer, or rather on Homer and other poets, as Socrates says at the end of his question, per i poietanti allon cae periumero, the last line of text 6. More precisely, Socrates asks Hippias for a comparison between the characters of Achilles and Odysseus. It is not correct to assume that such a synchrosis between the two Homeric heroes was already present in Hippias' declamation, as some scholars claim it because it is clearly a question of Socrates, who says he wants to know the sophist opinion about it, because he has heard from Apemantus, the father of Eudicus, that the Iliad would be superior to the Odyssey to the extent that Achilles is better than Odysseus. However, it can be assumed that in his declamation, Hippias actually gave a judgment on the two heroes, Achilles and Odysseus, Two, he probably did not develop a comparison. This can be argued also from the reformulation of the questions by Socrates, who asks the sophist to repeat what he said about Achilles and Odysseus using the imperfect tense. Uh, this is text uh, 7. Here Socrates asks again his question about Achilles and Odysseus and uh, says, uh, but what do you say to us about Achilles and about Odysseus? Uh, which do you say is the better man and uh, in what respect? Atarti de legeis emin perito Achilleus te caito Odysseus, potron ameno cae catatifas ainei. Then Socrates pretends that uh, he couldn't hear well uh, during the exhibition and uh, that uh, he hesitated to put his, question to, his questions to Hippias. And finally, he asks, 
But now, since there are fewer of us, and Judicus here urges me to question you, speak, instruct us clearly. What were you saying about these two men? How were you distinguishing them? Ti elegas peritutu in toin and drawin, pos diecrines autus. So, with uh, imperfect tense that indicates that the Ippias already talked about uh, Achilles and Odysseus in his uh, declamation, in his epilepsis. However, Hippias did not focus only on Achilles and Odysseus, but also on other heroes, at, uh, as it can be seen in his answer, in which he also includes judgment on Nestor uh, the, as the wisest of the Greek expedition. This is text 8, which is uh, considered a testimony of Hippias thought by Dils and Kranz, as well as more recently by Lux and Most. I read uh, the text. Well, says Hippias, I am glad to explain you even more clearly than before what I say about these men, or better, about these heroes and others too. I say that Homer made Achilles the best and bravest man of those who went to Troy, and Nestor the wisest, and Odysseus the, wi the wildest. Femigar, Homeron pe poiekenai, Ariston menandra Achillea ton ais Trojan afikomenon, sofata ton de Nestor, polutropata ton de Odyssea. Well, the reconstruction of uh, Hippias Epidexis could uh, reasonably continue with the passage reported in text 9, in which Hippias, provoked by Socrates' questions, defends the character of Achilles, claiming that he is simple and thoughtful, a plus status, status, and he contrasts him with Odysseus, who is versatile and liar, polytroposic episodes, where polytropos is understood by Hippias as a synonym for liar. Um, in support of this thesis, Hippias quotes some verses from Book 9 of the Iliad, in which Achilles, addressing himself to Odysseus, declares that he hates those who lie and tell the false. This will be the starting point for the discussion that occupies the central section of the Hippias Minor, where Socrates tries to demonstrate that Achilles is no less a liar than Odysseus, with a paradoxical reversal of roles. Uh, the passage is text 9 in the handout, but we are not going to read it because I don't want to go uh, too deep into the complex question about this passage, uh, which would uh, require an entire presentation uh, because of its much debated relationship with a scolium to the verse 1 of the Odyssey, which is also a fragment of the Socratic philosopher Antisthenes. Well, this, this would be another topic. Uh, so let's leave aside these more complex uh, questions, which is now not possible to address in detail. There is indeed another issue which I would like to address now, and namely the problem of the possible identification of Ippias Epideixis in the Ippias Minor with the speech attributed to the sophist Ippias in the Ippias Major. Uh, a speech uh, which is better known with the title Trojan speech that is preserved by Philostratus. The title is preserved by Philostratus. Mm, I refer to text uh, 10, the Ipias Major. Um, this text is considered uh, as a testimony by Dils and Kranz as well as by Lux and Most. In this passage, Hippias refers to a speech he himself composed that is set immediately after the capture of Troy and uh, has as main speakers Nestor and uh, Neoptolemus, the latter addressing the older hero to ask him what are the occupations to which a young man should dedicate himself. We can read the text in the translation by Woodruff. Hippias says, I have a speech about that, uh, that is about the activities a young man should take up, I put together really finely. The setting and the starting point of the speech are something like this. 
After Troy was taken, the tale is told that Neptolemus asked Nestor what sort of activities are fine, the sort of activities that would make someone most famous if he adopted them while young. Transkima de Moiestica Erketo Yade Tistulogu, Epeide e Troia Elo, Lega Yologos, Hotine Optolemos, Nestora Eroito, Poiaestica Epitedeumata, Antis Epitedeusas, Neoson, Eudokimotatos Genuito. After that, the speaker is Nestor, who teaches him, Neptolemus, many very fine customs. Metatauta, Lego Nestino Nestor, Caiupotizemino Sautò, Pampola Nomima, Caipancala. And then Hippias concludes, I displayed that, so this speech there in Sparta, and I expect to display it here in Athens the day after tomorrow in Phaedostratus schoolroom with many other fine things worth hearing. Eudicus, Apemantus' son, invited me. Well, apparently there are many similarities with Hippias Minor. Starting from the last information, namely that the organizer of Ipias conference, which will be held after two days in Athens, is precisely that Eudicus, son of Apemantus, whom you have seen as a, an intermediary between Socrates and Hippias at the beginning of the Ipias Minor. Furthermore, the protagonist of the Trojan speech is Nestor, the hero that Hippias inserted next to Achilles and Odysseus in his first answer to Socrates in text 8. If Nestor had not been a significant character for Hippias, Plato would have not inserted an otherwise superfluous element in the answer to a question that asked for a comparison between Achilles and Odysseus. However, the connection between the two dialogues that is established in Hippias Major is not uh, decisive. It can demonstrate at most the posteriority of the Ipias major on the Ipias minor, and possibly, if the Ipias major were, were spurious, it could be an attempt by the author of the dialogue to validate the authenticity of his work by reconnecting it to an authentic dialogue. But above all, the content of the two speeches seems to be substantially different, I think. In the Apias Major, in fact, the characters and events of the myth seem, seem to constitute only a background for the Trojan speech, the most important part of which was then the presentation by Nestor of advice and education of young people. Hippias' Trojan speech had to be, therefore, a protraptic speech in which the Homeric characters were only a starting point to introduce the Sophist educational program. On the contrary, the, the epidexis mentioned in the Ipias Minor seems to have Homer and uh, his characters as its object, as this uh, kind of title on Homer seems to indicate. Its content uh, could be imagined along the lines of the central section of the dialogue in which Socrates and Hippias offer an analysis of the Iliad according to the exegetical technique of the Zetema, identifying contradictions in the characters and proposing solutions. However, I come to the final observations. I don't want to claim that I have given uh, an answer, a definitive answer to these questions. Uh, it can also be possible that the uh, judgments on individual character, such as Achilles, Odysseus and Nestor, which we have seen in text 8, could also be found in a work such as the Trojan Speech, uh, which was not dedicated to the analysis of poetry, but could refer to some uh, characters of myth and uh, Homeric poems as positive or negative paradigms, paradigms of behavior. In the case of Hippias, there is clearly a preference for Nestor, who represents uh, the sage, and the preference for Achilles over Odysseus. This last judgment, uh, which is explicit in the Ipius Minor, might also find an implicit confirmation in the Trojan speech, since it is Nestor who takes care of the education of Neoptolemus, son of Achilles, a task that, according to the Homeric tradition, belonged to Odysseus. In conclusion, I think that it can be observed that both the Trojan speech and the epidexis referred to in the Ipius Minor offer us some important insights to illuminate the activity of Hippias, who is better known for his uh, historical and doxographical works, such as the 
olimpioniche anagrafe or the synagogue. Indeed, the textual passages that we have seen uh, demonstrate Hippias' recourse to epideictic uh, rhetoric with a poetic and mythological content in which the interpretation of poetry was probably uh, bent to a moral or a pedagogical purpose. This is evident in the testimony of the Hippias Major, but also from the Hippias Minor, we can see the tendency to morally interpret the Homeric heroes as a paradigm of behavior. This puts uh, Hippias' activity fully in line with the other sophists uh, who wrote mythological epidexis and in line with the genre of epideictic rhetoric itself. I have finished my presentation. Thank you very much, Silvia, for this sure. interesting paper. Uh, I shall call now Tito, and uh, we go straight. Tito uh, is, is working on a very brave, let's say, project in, in his PhD, no? Uh, from Gorgias, gorgeous for us, <laughs> and uh, until the, the, the uh, late antiquity with the author that you're going, Himerius would say in Portuguese, Himerius, <laughs> and is going to talk about funeral orations again, funeral John, yeah? So um, we yeah. have 20 minutes, and then we have some probably some questions, right? So I'll pass the word to Tito. Okay. Let's see if it works. It works. Okay. So thank you for having introduced me. And I have to thank the organizers for having given me this great opportunity. As you can see, the title of my presentation is Himerius and the Athenian Funeral Speeches. In the time given, I shall analyze form and contents of Himerius' polemarchic oration, where the sophist impersonates a polemarch delivering a funeral speech at the end of the 5th century BC. This imaginary oration imitates the Athenian funeral speeches even though the purpose is rather different since it is an oratorical display and a model of exercise. In the 4th century AD, Himerius taught rhetoric at Athens to students willing to complete their education. As a rule of thumb, Greek education in imperial times was divided into three stages. The highest degree of the ancient rhetorical curriculum consisted of education in uh, prose composition under the guidance of the rhetor or sophist. Here, students were accustomed to creating full deliberative or forensic orations, meletai, whose themes could be either imaginary or taken from Athenian history. However, before entering the world of declamation, students had to train on preliminary exercises called progymnasmata, which served as a bridge be between the second and third stage of education. Four handbooks of progymnasmata are extant, the first one being that of Elius Theon, a writer lived perhaps in the first century AD. The second handbook what? The second handbook is traditionally ascribed to Hermogenes while the most famous handbook in antiquity is that of Aftonius, a pupil of Libanius. The last one was written by Nicolaus the Sophist in the 5th century. The progymnasmata consisted of different types of speech, 
and were graded according to their difficulty so to help students advance in prose composition progressively. By working on the progymnasmata, students learn step by step how to acquire argumentative tools, how to follow and apply standard rules, and how to argue under increasingly complex headings. Aftonius lists the progymnasmata as follows. Fable, the, e, the simplest exercise, then narration, anecdote, and maxim, refutation and confirmation, commonplace, encomium and invective, comparison and speech in character, description, thesis, and introduction of law. The surviving handbooks differ from one another in the order and description of the exercises, but Aftonius remained the standard for many centuries for he systematized previous traditions while giving short descriptions and samples for each progymnasma. Now we can turn to the first example, the first exercise relevant for our present discussion, narration in Greek, diagema. Among the easiest exercises we find narration, which is more argumentative than fable, but less demanding than all the others. By practicing narration, students became accustomed to presenting the circumstances under debate in different ways, while arguing for and against them. So, the definition given by Aftonius is Diegemaestin excesis pragmatos gegonotos e hos gegonotos. Narration is defined as an exposition, while the subjects of narration are said to be events that have really happened or as though they had happened. That is, they do not need to be factually true. Consequently, the main classification applied to narration rests on the degree of truth present is in what is said. From a minimum to a maximum of truth, narration can be classified as mythical, fictitious or dramatic, like the, the case of tragedies and comedies, political and historical. Moreover, the handbooks provide information about the elements, stoicheia, needed for a complete narration. These elements are six in number and answer to the questions who, what, where, when, how, and why. Using the words of Aftonius, the elements are topraxan prosopon, topraxen pragma, chronos kathon, topos and ho, tropos hopos aitia di hen. The given elements help the student follow a complete and coherent organization. Only Theon, however, explains what can be said about the elements. The features ascribed by Theon to the actor or doer, doer so prosopon, are very close to those needed for developing an encomium. For instance, one can mention origin, morality, deeds, and so on. As to the thing done, so pragma, one can say, for example, whether it is dangerous or not, easy or difficult, just or unjust. As to the time, chronos, that the action took place in antiquity, during the night or at a festival. While to the course of actions, aitia, belong whether it was done to acquire good things, for the sake of the children, and so on. Well, many chapters of Himerius polemarchic oration correspond to the features of the exercise called narration. In chapter 5, Himerius is dealing with the origins of Athens and develops a common theme in Athenian funeral speeches, namely the, the love felt by the gods for Athens. And we can read it. 
Demeter, the matter, so the doer, had been wondering a planato, so the thing done, over every part of the earth under the sun as they tell it hos logos, that is, in antiquity, in pursuit of the abducted core ten arpagentes cores metadiocusa, so the cause. Having traversed the whole earth and the sea, she put an end to her wandering when she reached Eleusis, hos cateleusina gignetai, which is the place relevant for the Athenian glory, and got back the girl she had been searching for. As a reward for this doubly happy outcome, the goddess gave the fruits of the earth and the Eleusinian mysteries to those countrymen of ours who had brought an end to her wandering. She tamed our diet with the first gift and our minds with the second. This chapter displays every element needed for a complete narration, except for the manner, tropos. However, it is easy to imagine Demeter as suffering and grieving over her daughter. By comparing the treatment of the Athenian origins present in Himerius' oration with that of the classical funeral speeches, it is clear that what was in antiquity a boast of national pride and glory became many centuries later just a useful story to teach students how to create a simple mythical narration through a relevant episode of the Athenian heritage. And now we can turn to the second exercise relevant for our discussion, the encomium. Encomium belongs to the intermediate exercises and is preliminary to epideictic oratory which became the most frequent type of speech in imperial times. The definitions given by Theon and Pseudo-Hermogenes are the following. Encomium is language revealing the greatness of virtuous actions and other good qualities belonging to a particular person. The term is now specifically applied to praise of the living persons, encomium, whereas praise of the dead is called an epitaphios, and praise of the gods a hymn. Encomium is an exposition of the good qualities of a person or thing in general or individually. So encomium, as well as narration, represents an exposition. Encomia may be collective or individual, while the subjects of praise can be people, dead or alive, animals, cities, and the like. Given that Himerius' polemarchic oration imitates Athenian funeral speeches, it can be defined as an encomium for the Athenian dead soldiers, namely an epitaphios logos. So, every type of encomium follows the same standard themes, topoi, since they can be applied to any subject of praise. Theon distinguishes those themes related to the mind and character to those related to the body and those that are external. As you can see in the table on the left side, Theon distinguishes the external virtues, ta exothenemin, like origins, eugeneia, then the uh, virtues of the body, ta perisomatos, and the virtues of the mind, ta peripsyches. On the right side, we can see Aftonius, who lists, uh, who suggests uh, a proemium and then the praise of the origins, genos, and then the upbringing, anatrophe, the deeds, praxis, then comparison and uh, conclusion in the form of a prey. Now, remember these words, genos, paideia, praxis, we'll find them soon. The table shows that in the later tradition, these themes have been arranged so to follow the steps of a human life. 
The external virtues, taxothenamin, correspond indeed to the origins of an individual. However, in the Athenian funeral orations, the praise of Athens already followed the steps of a human life, as if Athens were a person. Moreover, the suggestions given by pseudo Hermogenes on how to praise a city resemble the traditional themes present in the Athenian funeral speeches. And surely you will undertake an encomium of a city without difficulty from these topics. For you will speak about its origin, saying that its people are autochthonous, perigenus hoti autochthones, and about its growth, how it was nurtured by gods and about education, how the people have been taught by the gods. And you will examine, as in the case of a man, what sort of manners the city has, what sort of institutions, what pursuits it follows, what it has accomplished. If we briefly follow the structure of Himiru's polemarchic oration, we can see clearly that he imitated the, the ancient models while following the handbooks of Progymnasmata. <clears throat> so, after having praised in the proemium the custom nomos of delivering a public funeral speech, stating that it is a purely Attic tradition, Himerius introduces the theme of autochthony to praise the origins of Athens. So, those who are eager to praise others and intend to celebrate their families, togenos, raise their orations up to a level of discourse in which we hear good things said about the ancestors of the loaded individuals or learn the place where those ancestors came from. For virtually all ancestors of people being extolled anywhere came to their country as foreigners. But as soon as you say Athenians, you make clear by that appellation that the people in question are autochthonous. Himerius places here many keywords belonging to the standard themes of praise present in the Athenian funeral orations, which have been systematized many centuries later by the handbooks of Progymnasmata. The section covering the Athenian origins contains other traditional commonplaces, for instance, Athens as the first teacher of the human race, the wanderings of Demeter, and we read that passage, the love of the gods, and many others. While the third section of this oration deals with Athens' philanthropic deeds towards the other Greeks. Deeds, praxis, are defined by pseudo-Hermogenes as the most important element of praise, and Aftonius agrees with him by stating that deeds are the greatest heading of the encomia. Tomegiston ton encomion kefalaion. Indeed, the longest section of Himerius' polemarchic oration deals with the Persian Wars. So, As the Persian king decided to go to war, Athens alone decided to help the fellow Ionians. Pure pisardis comizontes edex antote tois persais hotitines anthroponesin ypere leutherias et imahomenoi. So they burned Sardis and showed the Persians at that time that there were still people who fought for freedom. In the ancient rhetorical tradition, Athens has always fought for freedom. Athenian soldiers, indeed, are traditionally described as eager to die for freedom, and pseudo Hermogenes suggests that while praising a person, one can add something related to the manner of death. 
farther from the manner of his death, how he died fighting for his country, Ipertes Patridos Mahomenos. And if there was anything unusual about it, as in the case of Callimachus, because his corpse remained standing. Himerius dedicated the whole chapter 21 to the praise of Callimachus and Cinegirus, heroes of Marathon that became a common theme for declamations in imperial times. Himerius indulges in narrating the events that um, took place from the destruction of Sardis to the victory of Salamis, while the many fights that Athens faced until the end of the 5th century are highly compressed. Moreover, in comparison with the classical funeral orations, the praise of the Athenian democracy is lacking, as one can easily expect from a sophist writing imaginary orations under the late Roman Empire. However, Himerius fails to develop even other relevant sections present in the Athenian funeral speeches. Indeed, the consolation of the living is missing, while the exhortation is replaced by a short praise of the dead soldiers. And now we can draw some conclusions to help understand the meaning of the speech. Now, so, now, the purpose of Himerius was not to compete with the ancient models. This is why some relevant themes of the Athenian funeral speeches do not occur. Himerius had nobody to console nor to exhort. Moreover, the Athenian democracy did not belong anymore to the cultural panorama of, of Himerius. Moreover, it is hard to know whether he had ever read in full the Athenian funeral speeches. Since Himerius developed the proemium with many details, and spent much time in narrating the origins of Athens and the Persian Wars, it is likely that he read at least Plato's Menexenus, or the funeral speech attributed to Lysias. Even Isocrates Panegyricus is a good candidate. Also, it is reasonable to assume that Himerius took in account the Panathenaicus of Ilius Aristides and the Declamaciones of Polemo the Sophist, where the fathers of Callimachus and Cinegirus compete to receive the honor of delivering a funeral speech before their citizens. However, after having analyzed the Polemarchic oration in light of the Prognasmata, we can confidently state that Himerius imitated the Athenian funeral orations, for they were among the oldest kinds of epidictic speech at Athens, and because they fit the needs of a teacher willing to create an exercise inspired by Athenian heritage. Greek education in imperial times was more bookish than the Roman one and Himerius shows to be deeply fascinated with the Athenian glories of the past. To summarize, the polemarchic oration can be defined as a full-blown exercise on epidictic oratory based on the preliminary exercises called narration and praise. What is relevant is that this is the only speech of its kind in imperial times and the only, only extant imitation of the Athenian funeral speeches. Thank you. Many thanks, Tito. <laughs> Thank you. Well, 
We have 10 minutes, 11 minutes for questions. So let's see what Isadora says on the other side. <laughs> well, Hi, Tito, you, 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 you are following the YouTube as well, aren't you? So you, you can read that as well. Uh, we all can. There is a section for commentaries here, but uh, we have no questions so far. So maybe we can wait a little bit uh, and see that uh, everybody and see if someone has a question. Tiziano asked me if so, if uh, he could ask in Italian. So I'm waiting a question from me. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yes. I guess this is all right. <laughs> Yeah, it's not uh, full yet. I think he will write more. Can you read it, Silvia? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, can I reply in Italian? Of course, of course. Can I answer Italian? Okay. Naturalmente, è una domanda enorme. Effettivamente, diciamo che tutte le parti dei dialoghi platonici in cui abbiamo dei discorsi lunghi, una macrologia da parte di Socrate, quindi eh, mito, interpretazione poetica o qualsiasi altro tipo di macrologia da parte di Socrate può essere intesa come risposta all'EPDC sofistica, alla retorica più in generale, sulla falsa riga anche poi di quello che vediamo teorizzato nel, nel Fedro no? rispetto al Gorgia che è più critico rispetto alla retorica, nel Fedro abbiamo una teorizzazione una retorica filosofica, però poi qui si va chiaramente dell'interpretazione di, di Platone nel complesso. Diciamo che eh, rimanendo sui, sui dialoghi giovanili, quindi i dialoghi in cui emerge maggiormente la contrapposizione tra epidissi e macrologia e sofistica e dialogo, dialettica, dialeghe, stai socratico, c'è sempre questa contrapposizione tra il tempo dell'epidissi che impedisce il, lo scambio dialogico e poi il tempo del, del dialeghe stai socratico che a volte include anche una risposta lunga da parte di Socrate. Su questo comunque tutto quello che dico diciamo, si basa poi su, su studi soprattutto di, di Gian Antonio, di Gabriele Gian Antonio che sicuramente conoscete meglio di me che ha dedicato molto a questo tema, del, del, molti libri molto saggi a questi temi del dialeghe stai socratico. Beh, Spero che posso... Però... Posso aggiungere una piccola cosa? Certo. Sì. Ah, eh, beh, io ho studiato per la tesi magistrale eh, appunto il menesseno di Platone, quindi un dialogo, non dialogo, perché contiene al proprio interno un lungo, lunghissimo epitafio. Ehm, ovviamente la questione di come si pone... Eh, Platone rispetto alle Fidissi è gigantesca, ma eh, quello che mi sento di dire rispetto a eh, quell'opera che ho studiato, il Menesseno, è che Platone prende seriamente la questione delle Fidissi, della macrologia, eh, e infatti la imita molto spesso, è un bravissimo imitatore. Quello che quello che è la critica di Platone nel Menesseno è che bellissimo, insomma, dice, bellissima come pratica l'epidissimi, molto interessante, anche ricca di possibilità, solo che è un gioco per bambini, chiunque abbastanza acculturato, pepai deumenos, sarebbe in grado di scrivere un bel discorso. Altra cosa è il dialeghe, sai, e allora... Siccome nel menesseno il problema è capire soprattutto se è da prendere seriamente oppure no quello che dice l'epitafio, beh sì, è da prendere seriamente, ma come se fosse un gioco di bambini. Molto bello che strega le anime, però altra cosa rispetto alla pratica del dialogo. Grazie. 
É, alguma outra questão? Zatora. Por enquanto, não. É... I would have one for um, Tito. Um, it, caught my, uh, it caught my impression the fact that uh, Remedius um, imitates very closely the, to, uh, 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 I might say, to Cididia model <laughs> of funeral speech in Pericles and to Cididis. And but I was wondering if if whether the argument on Athenian autochtony autochtony could have a relation to the immediate immediate context of Hemerius in the fourth century. I mean, it's a you 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 said more than once that it's the only uh, oration which follows very closely which imitates very closely the athenian idea of funeral oration and do you think in the historical context immediate to himerius that could be a topic in the agenda you mean the political agenda i mean to to yeah. highlight uh, like the I talked to argument. Well, political agenda, no, um, probably not. Uh, however, um, we have to underline that Himerius was uh, was not a native of Athens. She came from Prusias, the Bithynic Prusias, so close to Istanbul. But Himerius decided to. Uh, study and teach for almost his entire life at Athens. So this was the choice of his life, living, I mean, in, in Athens. That's why perhaps uh, he indulges very often in his orations uh, in narrating um, things of the Athenian past. So probably the interest of Himerius in the autochthony motif, so the ancestral origins of Athens, the Athenian came from the very earth, that's the meaning of autochthon, uh, since this theme was a boast of pride for the ancient Athenians, he wanted to emphasize this aspect because he wanted to be a new Athenian eight centuries later, but he was really fascinated with the Athenian glories. And that's why he indulges so much time in narrating the Athenian origins, because he loved Athens, even uh, because he chose to live there. I guess. OK, thank you. I well, will have one minute, so I think. Yeah, we don't have uh, any yeah. other questions. And I think we wouldn't have more time to discuss it in case we had one. <laughs> so thank you very much, Tito and Silvia. Uh, it was a great section and and very well uh, interrelated topics in my view. So thanks to everyone who organized, <laughs> because the program is very uh, suitable. So yeah, let's see, let's meet up again online later at 2, right, Isadora? Yes, at 2. At 2. Okay. Many thanks. Thank you.